first of all, let me thank my colleagues who are sitting on the panel for me, and I uh, appreciate their willingness to step in, uh, particularly when I'm unable to make it down with you. Uh, just to give you a very quick overview of the State of the Nation uh, Study K-12 Online Learning in Canada for the year 2012. Just a reminder that um, this is actually the fifth year that we've done this study, and you can see the various covers there going across the screen. Uh, essentially, actually, it's the same color, just with a different color on the top every year. And you can see this year we've uh, gone with the uh, light blue. As well, I want to, uh, before I... Sorry, before I get started, I'd like to um, thank the sponsors uh, for this year. We've got uh, LEARN, which is a program based in Quebec. We've got Heritage Christian Online School, which is a program based in British Columbia. Uh, Learning Mate, which is a uh, company up here in Canada, although they actually operate internationally. I know they've got a big presence in the U.S. as well. Uh, Florida Virtual Schools Global Operations. And as well, this year's report was published by Open School BC, uh, who provided uh, some, some great support throughout. Looking at the report itself, um, as a reminder, basically one of the things that we do is we essentially contact each of the ministries. We also look at key stakeholders within each of the provinces and territories, as well as, in some cases, a, a document analysis. Uh, you'll note that from year to year, uh, the ministry's participation level in some jurisdictions has been great and others not so much. Um, this year, for example, we had cooperation from all of the ministries except for Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, last year, we had cooperation from all of the ministries, and um, that was the first time that that had happened. Uh, but you can see that um, in every single year, we've been able to use a combination of those three sources to be able to get uh, the material that we need to be able to do the report. Looking at the report itself, we've it's broken down into two parts. The first is looking at the regulations, and the second is looking at the level of activity. Um, as you can see from this table here, the regulations vary dramatically from um, jurisdictions like uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, Quebec, and Saskatchewan that have no regulations whatsoever to ones that use ministerial handbooks to ones that use memorandums of understanding between the particular province and uh, or the particular territory in another jurisdiction. Uh, in the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually contained in the collective agreement. Um, you know, so you see a great, uh, a wide variety of, of ways in which K-12 uh, online learning is regulated in Canada. Um, in most instances, the regulation tends to be fairly small. Um, in the case of, for example, the handbooks, it tends to be things that people must agree to in order to participate in the program. Uh, British Columbia is probably the only real exception to that, um, to a lesser extent maybe Ontario as well, where there are, are specific contracts that the people have to enter into based upon either legislation or ministry requirements in order to upload or to in order to um, participate in online learning or to run an online learning program. Um, looking at the country as well in terms of activity, again, we've got a wide variety of the type of activity that actually occurs as well. You see in Atlantic Canada for those provinces that actually have uh, programs, because uh, PEI doesn't have one right now, um, you see they tend to be uh, province-wide programs, uh, as you can see. Uh, Central Canada is primarily district-based programs. In the case of Ontario, that's with the ministry's uh, active involvement. In the case of Quebec, it's with the ministry's absence of involvement. Um, going across into Western Canada, you see there's a, a district-based programs tend to be the, the flavor of the, the day, although, as you can see in Alberta and Manitoba, they also have um, provincial-based programs as well. Interestingly, both the Yukon and the Northwest Territories are in the process now of creating their own programs, although they still use programs from other provinces. Um, and Nunavut, as well as PEI, utilize programs from other provinces. In the case of Nunavut, it's from Alberta. In the case of PEI, it's actually from New Brunswick. In terms of the amount of activity, I it's quite interesting to see the variation in terms of the number of students that are actually involved. Nationally, we've got about 5% of the student population, and that's an estimate, obviously, um, that are involved in K-12 distance education of some kind. Um, as you can see, in the average tends to be about 2% if we exclude the top two provinces. So if you look at British Columbia and Alberta, for example, both of those provinces have more than 10% of their students that are enrolled in one or more courses. 
uh, whereas the next highest to that is actually uh, Manitoba at 4.7%. So if you excluded those top two, the average actually drops to about 2%. So those two provinces are really pushing the enrollment in um, K-12 online learning. Um, and I mean, one of the things that we've seen is that these numbers have increased year by year. Uh, four years ago, we didn't do a national count in the first state of the nation, but beginning with the second one, you can see that we estimated there to be about 140,000, and that had been up nine years earlier um, from an estimate that was provided by the Canadian Teachers Federation of about 25,000. So if you look at basically over the past decade, uh, the number of students that have participated in K-12 online learning has increased about tenfold. Um, in terms of some of the national trends that we're seeing here, oops, that looks like it didn't quite come out the way I wanted it to. It should be four points there. Uh, the first one, um, distance ed, as you can see from those slides, continues to grow. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, compared to other jurisdictions, the correspondence offerings tend to be much more prevalent in Canada than we see, particularly in the United States, and that tends to happen more at the elementary level, although there's a significant amount of... of um, high school uh, correspondence that's still going on, although much of that is actually focused upon sort of the students that have dropped out or uh, adult populations. That third and fourth point should actually just be a, a third one there. Um, in a lot of cases, blended learning continues to be seen as simply a effective use of information communications technology or essentially a good use of technology integration. Um, those of us within the field of K-12 online learning have a good understanding of what blended learning is, can point to examples of that, and if you look through at the report this year, you'll see some specific places where we've highlighted that. But those outside of the field, in all honesty, even with all of the um, media attention on online and blended learning, a lot of them are doing blended learning but don't realize that they're actually doing it. They just see it as a, an effective use of ICT. The other thing that we've got in Canada that is, I think, unique, at least within North America, is unions continue to be f quite supportive of this. Um, you know, we, we've seen unions become actively involved in Canada in promoting the use of K-12 online learning from uh, resolutions passed by the uh, Ontario Secondary Schools Teachers Federation to partnerships that the Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association have engaged in with their um, province-wide virtual school. But having said that, it's it's a cautious support because like a lot of folks, I think, they're still trying to get their heads around what this actually looks like, what this means for teachers in the field. And organizations like the British Columbia Teachers Federation and the Alberta Teachers Association have actually done a pretty good job trying to do research designed to figure out, you know, what exactly does this look like in terms of, of teacher workload and teacher quality of life? And how can we ensure that there I that these people have the ability to continue to be innovative in, in both their programs and in their individual teaching. So not to stifle that innovation, but also to ensure that they're not taken advantage of. Um, you know, a typical classroom teacher in, in Canada, um, when you look at at least uh, at the high school level of their five or six classes they're teaching, are probably going to be responsible for about 150 to 180 kids. Um, you know, five or six classes, roughly 30 kids in a class. Um, We've got reports of online teachers in some jurisdictions that have, you know, 400 active students, um, you know, and the question then becomes, depending upon how the program is designed, delivered, and supportive, is that an equitable workload to the same classroom teacher that's in there? It's not going to be an equal one, obviously, because the nature of the work is different. But, you know, how can we ensure that these people aren't being taken advantage of? And that's where the unions are kind of wrestling with, you know. But having said that, they, they tend to be quite interested and engaged in, and quite supportive of K-12 online learning. Um, you can go and um, I know there's a copy on your key drives uh, that were provided to all participants of this year's report. You can also go to this wiki. Actually, it should be virtualschool.wikispaces dot com forward slash Canada so that's wikispaces dot com forward slash Canada um, and you'd be able to download a copy of the report there and if you have any specific questions um, that the panel aren't able to address for you you can contact me at one of those uh, addresses there otherwise I hope you uh, have a great panel and uh, thank you for letting me be a part of it and thanks once again for my panelists for agreeing to do this <laughs>